uh, we are really, really happy to uh, be able to do this both in person and through the wonder of technology. Uh, we're able to do this program and all the other programs and, and things that we do here at the History Center because of our, our donors and because of our members and because of our sponsors. And so uh, this program in particular has a couple sponsors. It's made possible with generous support of AARP Florida, the TBHC Endowment Fund at USF and USF Libraries, along with media support provided by WSF Public Media. And the AARP, in particular, uh, sponsorship allows us to have closed captioning with this program when people are watching it on Zoom. And so those of you who are watching this on Zoom, either uh, live or uh, taped, delayed afterward, um, all you have to do is go to closed captioning in your Zoom meeting controls. Those of you guys here, you're here. So uh, also, for those of you who are here, we are certainly welcome that you are welcome to answer, or excuse me, ask any questions that you, that you like and that you have. Uh, but those who are watching live at home, only those watching live, uh, can use the Q&A feature in Zoom. If you are watching this uh, after the fact, you definitely can use uh, the Facebook uh, contact system to ask us any questions that you have about this program. Um, so, before we get going with our, our program today, I do want to talk about a couple of things we have upcoming in April. Uh, April 13th, we have a Florida Conversations that uh, relates directly to our new temporary exhibit, Cuban Pathways. And so, that program is a, a panel discussion uh, presented by Lizette Campos, uh, Marucci Azarin, who's one of our board members here and the, one of the main sponsors of the Cuban Pathways exhibit, along with uh, Dr. Brad Massey, the curator of that uh, Cuban Pathways exhibit. If you all haven't seen it in the Wayne Thomas Gallery, I strongly encourage that you do so. It'll be on display through next March. You've got plenty of time, but uh, also don't wait too long because we want to make sure you come here and see it and come back and see it again. And then that was originally going to be our last Florida Conversations for the season, but we actually have added another one, kind of a bonus program, which is April 27th. And that is a program on the governors of Florida. And there is a book that was published a year or so ago uh, by the University Press of Florida on the governors of Florida, edited by Boyd Murphy and Robert Taylor. And there's uh, 30 or so scholars who've written uh, essays about every one of Florida's governors. And so the two uh, editors of the book, uh, Dr. Murphy and, and Dr. Taylor, are going to come here and talk about some of their favorite governors that were written about in the book. And we're going to have a special appearance by our own Tampa governor, uh, Governor Bob Martinez. So uh, those of you who'd like to show up here and, uh, and see Governor Martinez, you can. Or again, if you can't show up in person, you can tune in via Zoom. So today's program is Suncoast Empire, Bertha Onro Palmer, her family, and the rise of Sarasota. And we have two great speakers, uh, Frank Cassell, PhD, author and professor emeritus and president emeritus at the University of Pittsburgh at Greensburg, and Phyllis Alexandrov, exhibit artist and former supervisor for art and humanities with the Hillsborough County Public School System. And they're going to tell you all about Bertha Palmer. And in between those two great guests, you're going to have me talking a little bit about kind of my own Bertha Palmer experience. So with that, I will bring up Dr. Cassell. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Rodney. I appreciate the introduction. Good evening to you all. This looks like a reasonably well-fed, happy crowd. I can't see those of you that are zooming into this, but I assume you're also well-fed. I'm not, but I'm going to try to go down to the cafe <laughs> after, this, after this is over. So we're going to talk about Bertha Palmer. It is uh, Women's History Month, uh, so this is a very good time to talk about her. Probably a woman um, who is not as well known as she should be. Um, I suppose part of that is, is that she is so important in so many different ways and in so many different physical areas that uh, it's, it's hard to put it all together to understand just how impressive uh, this woman was. Uh, now, you're looking at a picture, I think, of Bertha. 
That's Bertha. How many of you uh, know very much about Bertha? Ah, oh, we've got a few people. Anybody from Chicago here? Ah, oh, in the back we have one. Um, well, she's uh, she's a Chicago figure to begin with. Chicagoans tend to know something about her, uh, but know nothing about what she did down here. Um, she um, she is generally thought of when she is thought of, all too often, as what you see there, a woman of wealth, a woman of style, a social queen. Because like Mrs. Astor in New York, Mrs. Palmer ran Chicago society and determined who, who was acceptable and who was a wannabe. And it was all done through the simple device of her invitation lists. And if you were on the lists, which were faithfully reported in the newspapers of Chicago, you were in. And if your name did not appear, you were very much on the outside. Um, this is a woman of such wealth that on a single evening at her home in Chicago, wore jewels in today's dollars worth $2.3 million. At one event, in Chicago. And that wasn't all the jewels that she had, by the way. Those are the ones that she chose to wear that particular evening. Even when she began to make Florida and Sarasota her w winter home, people still were blinded by the glitz, uh, by the fact that uh, she had this vast estate that she rode around in fancy cars, which of course she rarely drove, had other people to do that. She, she was known because of all the rich and famous people who came to Sarasota to visit her. She was impressive to people because reporters from all the Chicago papers and the New York Times and elsewhere uh, beat a path to her door in Sarasota to report on how the society queen of Chicago was raising hogs and cattle in Florida. Uh, and so it's very easy when you think of Mrs. Palmer to, to fixate on those aspects of her. They're not unimportant, by the way. And each of those things that she did as a social leader uh, required a lot of uh, talent, shall we say, to, uh, to succeed and also to continue to do it for as long as she did. But there was much, much more to this woman. Uh, this, this was a woman of extraordinary intelligence, a woman of keen ambition, a woman of tremendous competitive spirit, and perhaps most importantly to her successes was the fact that she was politically savvy. Uh, and she had a lot of experience working with state, local, and federal, and foreign governments, and it stood her in good stead in all of her activities. Bertha came to Sarasota in 1910. How did she get there? Well, let's talk a little bit about her background. Uh, she, uh, she was born in 1849 at Louisville. Uh, her father, Henry, brought the entire family from Louisville to Chicago just before the Civil War. And uh, he proved to be adept at making money out of land sales <coughs> in the Loop area and to the west of the Loop area in Chicago and made a, a quite a bit of money and thus his uh, family lived well Bertha and her sister were educated very well uh, for women in that, in that particular age. Uh, she, I looked at her school records, by the way. She, she got an A in everything. I mean, she was she 
music and uh, literature, whatever. She was good at it. Uh, now, the, she meets in a friend of her father's by the name of Potter Palmer. Potter Palmer uh, is a guy that makes his first splash as developing one of the first truly modern department stores in America, uh, which eventually he sells to a guy named Marshall Field. So those of you that know Chicago know that forever Marshall Field and Company was, uh, was the place to shop, the place to go, particularly at Christmas, sit under the Christmas tree and have tea. Um, he developed all that. He developed, he was particularly good at attracting women to his store. Um, for one thing, I, I don't want to be too gross in this, he recognized that women needed a place to go, so to speak, in the store at a time when most stores did not provide such facilities and women had to get on and go home, you know, <laughs> to uh, take care of their business. He, on the other hand, developed it into an art form, beautiful facilities, a sitting room, uh, and uh, so it, women loved to shop there. He also let them buy on time, which was a new innovation at the time. And he was the guy to go to for all the latest fashions from Europe, including art. He often went to Europe and, and, and purchased things uh, for, his, uh, for his customers. Uh, Bertha, he meets uh, very early on. Um, there was a problem. Uh, they were 23 years apart in age. Uh, even when she was 14, he was talking about marrying her. Uh, but in the end, uh, you know, he waited and waited and waited and waited, and at 22, she finally agreed uh, to, uh, to, to marry him. And they were getting ready to move into his new hotel, the Palmer House Hotel in Chicago, but they never made it uh, because it burned down in 1871 in the Great Chicago Fire. In fact, all of Potter Palmer's uh, vast real estate holdings in Chicago were burned up. Uh, he lost virtually everything. But with the encouragement of his wife, he did rebuild his fortune and rebuilt the Palmer House. And they did indeed move into it. She had both her kids there. <clears throat> and it was from there that she began her career as the social leader of Chicago. Now, in 1880, Potter Palmer uh, built a house for his wife uh, called the castle. There it is. That, uh, the castle, which is where she wore $2.3 million in, in, in jewelry at a party, cost $27 million to build. So even here on, the, on this rich, wealthy coast, west coast of Florida, <laughs> that's a lot of money to pay for a, for a house. And she did all the decoration, and it wasn't cheap. Uh, the interior of the house, we have a shot, I think. Um, back one, yeah. She, uh, both of them, Bertha and Potter Palmer, were, were art collectors. And once married, she traveled to Europe with him on his, on his visits to buy things. And they compiled a large, large, um, holding of art, particularly French art, and particularly French Impressionist art, which would hang in their home, uh, or her home here in Florida uh, for decades before it finally went to permanent location at uh, the Chicago Art Institute, where you can view it, you can view it today. Uh, the, uh, the thing that projected Mrs. Palmer into global attention. She was already a big star in Chicago. But what, what projected her into global importance was the Columbian Exposition of 1893. This is a picture of the main part, one of the main parts of the fair, the administration building in the right and the machinery building on the left. 
in a place where John Philip Sousa led his marine band in concerts. Uh, she was chosen to be the president of the Board of Lady Managers. It was the first, as she was fond of saying, it was the first time that government had discovered women. It was the first agency of government specifically for women, and it was funded in, in part by, uh, by the federal uh, uh, government. Um, it was left pretty much to her and to the members of the Board of Lady Managers, which represented all of the states of the Union, to figure out what they were going to do. There wasn't a lot of direction from anybody. She, first of all, raised the money necessary to build a woman's building. There, in all, never at any previous World's Fair had there been a women's building. This is it. And you're looking in the upper right-hand corner at a picture of Sophia Hayden, who was the architect for the building, um, who was one of the earliest uh, women to get a, a university degree in architecture from MIT, and uh, that's what she designed. And it uh, was uh, uh, not one of the biggest buildings at the fair, but it, uh, but it was certainly one of the most socially important uh, edifices uh, that uh, came into existence for that great event. Um, she, that building was packed full, in part largely thanks to Bertha's management of the situation, was it set out to, to sort of articulate and show and prove the enormous importance of women in world history. Uh, so that every invention that had been patented by a woman was on display. Every book written by a woman was on display uh, in there. It was staggering. Uh, every day uh, there were, were sessions discussing women's issues. Uh, and it was kind of famous around the World's Fair circles that when a couple came to the World's Fair and paid, each paid their 50 cents to go in the door, uh, the woman made it straight for the women's building. Well, the guy walked past it to see uh, the Egyptian dancing girls out on the, <laughs> down the way a bit. Uh, and apparently they were both pleased with what they got for 50 cents. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the fair, to, to make the, the, the women's work at the fair, women's display at the fair work, she, it had to be international. She couldn't, she couldn't just get the support of all the women's clubs in America, which she did, uh, who sent displays, but she had to reach out to all, all the other nations to get the women there involved. Uh, some of those she visited personally, kings and queens, uh, members of nobility throughout Europe. Uh, uh, she personally saw them and begged and pleaded that they establish women's committees, World's Fair committees, and put together exhibits and send them to Chicago. And they did, for the most part. And those women, that uh, important women she couldn't reach personally, she, uh, she, she wrote to them. So in the case of the Empress of Japan, uh, she wrote to the Empress of Japan, who indeed, in that nation which had only recently seen the light of International Day, uh, she set up a women's committee, and they did and send uh, a display for the women's building and went beyond that. They also set up a whole uh, marvelous display of Japan, a, uh, a kind of a temple complex, uh, which uh, w uh, 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 called the Ho-Den, which was really quite remarkable. It was the first exposure of many Americans to, uh, Japanese, uh, to Japanese culture. Well, the fair ended uh, with uh, Bertha being one of the best known American women in the world. Um, what now? And this became an increasing question in her life as she reached one turning point after another. What now? She went back to 
uh, being the, the, the hostess uh, and the uh, head of, of Chicago society. Um, she even cracked, uh, she uh, even cracked into the New York society, Mrs. Astor, who uh, I guess ended up at least being on speaking terms with her. Uh, uh, she even got into politics a bit, even though she couldn't vote, but she was the campaign manager for her older son, Honoré uh, Palmer, who, uh, under her uh, political guidance, wins the election to be on the city council. And the fact that he ran as a Democrat in, uh, in a solidly Republican area uh, <laughs> Uh, didn't seem to make any difference. But she invited everybody over to the castle, gave them a drink, and before long, the votes rolled in and the son was elected to two terms. In 1902, though, Potter dies. He'd been ill for some time and he dies. What now for Bertha? Where does she go now? Well, the answer is that she goes, uh, she begins spending more time in Europe. She already had estates uh, in various places in England and an apartment in Paris and a, and a house in London. And uh, she begins to spend more time there. And before long, she becomes a part of the entourage of this fellow, Edward VII, the King of England. You all remember Edward VII? Did you always watch those wonderful he was the son of Victoria, who finally <laughs> succeeded to the throne. Uh, he was a bit of a character, to put it mildly. And he did have a soft spot for American widows, and he had a, several of them that he sort of kept around him. But for years, uh, Mrs. Palmer was part of this entourage uh, that uh, kind of toured the great uh, estates of England and held great parties. She threw real bashes at her home in London, at one point even bringing an entire <laughs> opera company over from, from Paris to perform. Uh, and uh, apparently she enjoyed it. She had a good time at it. But in 1910, Edward VII was dying. Uh, and she was in Chicago, and she was in the castle, which was a wonderful, spectacular home, but it's February, it's Chicago, it's the Lake Michigan lakefront, and it's a drafty house. And she's reading the Chicago Tribune and reads an ad for citrus production, buy land and grow citrus in Sarasota, Florida. And the guy that puts the ad in the paper actually had an office at the, uh, in, in Chicago in the Loop she checked him out, had her father talk to him, and uh, he persuaded her to, to go to Sarasota. So within a week or so, she and members of her family get on her, her private Pullman railroad car, and in a 22-hour journey, they end up at the end of the line, because Sarasota was the end of the line. Beyond it was jungle with a few scattered settlements. And they'd come to Sarasota, a town of about 900 people. Uh, and uh, that it was in the midst of a depression and was going, it was going uh, nowhere. Uh, we shouldn't rush by the, the cows. Uh, can we get back to, go back one to the cows? Nope, we can't. All right, there, nope. All right. Oh, okay. That, by the way, if you know Sarasota at all, is Five Points, which is the very center of downtown Sarasota. Uh, and, it, uh, and here we have uh, cows drinking water out of it, uh, largely unpaved streets. Um, she called it Coint. Anyway, she meets people, she talks to people, uh, and suddenly something happens. She really begins to take an interest. And she decides, yeah, this is a good place to winter in, to get out of Chicago. And I like this, and 
So she starts looking around and she buys some property uh, in Osprey, uh, you know, where she thinks she can, she can build, a, build a house. Um, that house, by the way, is called, was called, The Oaks, capital T, capital O, always referred to that way. 35 rooms. Um, and was, uh, you know, she brought in, uh, there was an existing cabin there, so to speak. Uh, and she brought in one of her Chicago architects to redesign the whole thing and make it more suitable. It actually ended up as one of the biggest and grandest houses on the West Coast. Um, the, uh, the thing about it was, though, as she did this, as she moved around, as she saw more and more of the Sarasota area, it began to dawn on her that maybe the next phase of her life, she was 61 now, at an age where being in your 60s was pretty old, uh, she looked around and thought, you know, I could make money here. I could make money here. And so she decides not merely to winter, not merely to entertain, not merely to play with the grandkids, but to become a real businesswoman. So she promptly buys 140,000 acres. Think of that, 140,000 acres. Now some of that is, um, uh, uh, here in uh, in Tampa, and uh, 19,000 acres was the amount of land in, in what was called River Hills Ranch, uh, and then she bought another hunk of land which she dubbed Virginia Park, which was in South uh, Florida. So she went, she she wasn't entirely uh, just Sarasota. She was looking at Tampa uh, for opportunities. Uh, River Hills Ranch, if you don't spot that, uh, became Temple Terrace and um, also the University of South Florida <laughs> and uh, Bush Garden. So that was some of the land that she, that she had uh, here. Virginia Park, entirely, uh, probably the most ambitious urban development that she put together here in Florida, uh, although it did not end up well for her. Uh, but back in, in Sarasota, back in the Sarasota district, which by the way, to be clear, was the southern third of Manatee County. Sarasota County did not yet exist. The, uh, the estate she built, uh, which was called Osprey Point, today we call it uh, uh, Historic Spanish Point, uh, but uh, when she owned it and built it, uh, 350 acres, Osprey Point, uh, somewhat mir mirroring what she had learned about gardens and uh, the relationship of gardens to buildings from her days with Edward VII because she had had an ample opportunity to study Edwardian garden uh, design and development. And she applies much of that uh, to her gardens uh, that are part of her estate. This, uh, this still exists. I mean, that's a, a famous uh, area of of historic uh, Spanish Point. You can go see it today if you haven't seen it. Uh, by the way, there's only 30 acres at Spanish Point of the 350 acres that made up her estate. So it's, it's a fraction, a small fraction of, of what the estate was. The estate, uh, Osprey Point, was a whole small city. Uh, barracks uh, for workers uh, were there, central kitchens were there. Um, there were different kinds of quarters for her vast uh, personal staff at the Oaks uh, who didn't mix with the gardeners and the people that were 
uh, taking care of the farm. There was a whole farm that was there. It was pretty much self-sufficient. Uh, they grew most of, the, most of the food that they needed. And indeed, they grew a considerable excess. And so for the first time, we find Mrs. Palmer, who had insisted on a railroad being built uh, between uh, Sarasota and Venice, <laughs> She now, the railroad had to stop right at her place and she could load, she could load this excess citrus and crops on here and it went north and she began marketing her stuff and making a profit uh, in the north and in Canada. Uh, and that was kind of a taste for her. She began to, uh, you know, this is pretty exciting stuff and uh, she's got all this land now, and what is she going to do with it? Uh, well, I think she originally, to be honest about it, thought that she was going to do what uh, Henry Plant had done uh, here. Um, uh, well, you, you get some railroads, you build some fancy hotels, you, know, you get your rich friends to come down sell them some land, they move in, they bring their rich friends down, and uh, that's how we're going to get along here. Uh, and she actually did some touring, both on the east and west coast, to sort of see uh, how, this, uh, how this was done. But in the end, although she made some efforts in that, it became apparent that these 140,000 acres, except for the land that was right on the water, was not suitable for what she for, for rich people. Rich people weren't going to buy bogs because most of uh, most of the land in the as you go further south in Florida at this time is underwater all or part of the year, unless there's a ridge in the name. Um, you know, we live on, on, on what do we live on Tatum Ridge? Well, you can hardly tell there's a ridge there. But it's an old, what actually it is, is an ancient sea beach. It was a beach created as the sea ebbed and, and flowed across Florida. This was the point where it dumped sand or something. And anyway, it built up a, a bit of a ridge. There you could, you could run cattle and there you could, you could grow crops. But the rest of it, the best you could do is run uh, you know, kind of scurvy cattle. Uh, and, you know, who were uh, infested with the Texas tick. Uh, now, so she, um, she has to do, really be bold. And she decides, all right, I'm going to make my market different. I'm not going to go after just the rich guys. I'm going to go after this burgeoning middle class brought into existence by technology and uh, by urbanization and uh, the growth of cities. What we have are a bunch of people that used to be on the farm who are now in cities. And some of them get tired of it. They don't do well there. And they would like a way out of it. There was something going on, and she was aware of it, called the Back to the Land Movement in that period. Uh, where people were seeking opportunities uh, to get out of the urban industrial rat race. And what she figured out was, you know, if I do this right, I can offer land to grow to all these people, uh, make it possible for them to learn how to be farmers, and make a lot of money. It was not easy. Her first venture was Bee Ridge Farms, it was called. Uh, you probably don't know Sarasota all that well. Bee, there's Bee Ridge Road that you can get off of, off of uh, uh, 75. Uh, actually, uh, the town of Bee Ridge isn't on Bee Ridge Road. It's a, <laughs> it's a slightly different location. But nonetheless, uh, she took 8,000 acres, which is quite a bit of land, and she hired enormous numbers of African-American laborers, primarily. And she dug over 50 miles, not she, but she, her employees dug over 50 miles of, of, 
uh, canals to get rid of all that water that for thousands of years had stood there and which in fact played an important ecological role uh, but that was not something that the Floridians of that era or perhaps even for this era were particularly, uh, particularly concerned about. Uh, so she got the water off and then of course then the problem is that uh, if you're going to get the full benefit of agriculture in Florida, you've got to be, have water in the dry season. And so she dug uh, artesian wells uh, on every 10 and 20 acre site that made up, the, they, they cut this 8,000 acres into that. But that was just the beginning. She ran roads past every one of those sites. Uh, she, she put in utilities. Uh, she built the town of Bee Ridge to be a center, a community center and a commercial center for the people uh, living there. Uh, the railroad station there, they were so optimistic about the future of Bee Ridge that the, that the uh, Seaboard Rail Company, Seaboard Airline Railway, built a, uh, a station there for 5,000 people. It could, it could handle 5,000 people which was more people than in the entire county, or what would be the county of Sarasota at one time. Uh, it, and it was successful, she sold it. Uh, she and her family did amazing things, had a nationwide advertising campaign, for example. And it was said, and I don't know if it's true, but it was said that with their advertising and all the newspapers in America and the magazines, that news of Bee Ridge made it into every household in Canada and the United States. And obviously beyond that, because she sold that land to all kinds of people coming from all over the place. We even, have, uh, I, in my book, I even <laughs> found an interesting case of a, of a, a, a Conestoga wagon that had taken a family west who had then, uh, you know, had been driven out of the west by bad weather and so they bought land in a site unseen at Bee Ridge and then drove the Conestoga wagon from, I think it was Nebraska, all the way here, except that they didn't have any money so the, the guy had to stop the wagon and, and earn money and, as a laborer for a while so that they could continue. But they did get down here and there they had the land. The result was, by the way, you could grow two crops a year in Florida if you did it right, and that's what she was trying to do. You can only grow one crop a year for the most part in the north. But now, if you do it right, you can grow two crops a year. And because of her care and building the railroad and all that sort of stuff, you can get those stu that stuff to market. And in fact, you can get it there faster then the Californians can get it there because it really, before very long, it was apparent that who you were competing with, with were the California vegetable and citrus interests. Yeah, in any case, this was her first foray into this. She sold out the 8,000 acres. Uh, then she did exactly the same thing next door at something she called Osprey Farms. So altogether, 20 square miles 20 square miles, 20 miles on a side, 20 miles on a side, all of that land was rebuilt, remade, and became farmland which was populated with a permanent population, not tourists, but a permanent tax-paying population, which was the secret, and people understood it at the time, that the secret to a community's success was not an, you know, just tourism. It had to be an all year round population. So that was two of the things she did. I'll mention briefly a couple of others. Here we have hogs and cattle. She put together on the Mayaka River uh, something called Meadow Sweet Pastures. This was kind of a personal project. Um, in part, Meadow Sweet Pastures served as a a getaway uh, where she and her grandsons uh, could um, go and have a picnic or even camp out 
at least as the super rich camp out. I mean, one didn't lie on the ground. I mean, they <laughs> they brought the cook along. And it <laughs> but for them, I guess it was uh, it was a kind of roughing it. Um, the um, the Meadowsweet Pastures is important because, like Bee Ridge, we see Bertha as, an, as, an, as somebody that understood the importance of planning and, above all, of knowledge and information. Uh, she, she's a society lady. What does she know about farming? What does she know about cattle? What does she know about pigs? If you look real closely, you can see uh, with the Duroc uh, hogs there, Bertha's in that picture. Uh, what did she know? Well, the fact was she didn't know anything about it. But she certainly could hire people. But that wasn't good enough because a good business person wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go into something, you know, totally relying on hired help to carry it off. She trained herself. I spent a long time going through her records in Chicago and in Sarasota. One of the things that comes across is the enormous number of pamphlets and books that she acquired, many from uh, 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 university extension services around the United States, some from uh, state agricultural agencies, and very prominently were United States Department of Agriculture materials. They were, they were pamphlets on every conceivable kind of question one would have about how to, how to raise corn or how to raise cattle. And she trained herself. It was, it, it was absolutely astonishing when you stop and think about it. This, this woman was worth at least $12 million in, in, uh, in in those terms, in that day, in those dollars, I won't even try to estimate what it would be today, but it, she didn't need to do that. But she wanted, if she was going to be a businesswoman, she was going to do it right. And so she learned, she applied the latest technology. She, uh, the, the problem of, of cattle raising was the Texas tick. That, that, you know, I mean, I guess there's no Florida tick, so. They didn't, you know, it's easier to blame it on Texas. It's like the Asian flu. I mean, <laughs> so uh, the Texas tick infected almost all Florida cattle. The Florida cattle were left to run in the jungle, uh, and they picked this stuff up. Some of them got eaten by alligators. Uh, and then at some point in the year, they'd kind of round them up and, and sell them. Uh, what she figured out was that this was, this was really dumb. And the information was already there. They knew, uh, USDA knew what the Texas tick was, and they knew how to get rid of it. And so what you see here is a device which allowed cattle to be driven through this narrow pathway where they would have to walk through an emulsion of coal oil and other such things, which uh, must have been very unpleasant. And, and, and actually, they had to do it every two weeks. But the result was they killed the ticks. But that wasn't enough, because if they got through that and they went back into the wild and were and running around the jungle, they'd just get the tick again. And they'd be just as you know, worthless as before. She fences in. Remember the cattle downtown Sarasota? That was, uh, you know, that farmers, uh, uh, stock raisers believed it was their God-given right to run these, these animals anywhere. Uh, and it was a huge fight in Sarasota and everywhere to, to begin to try to fence these animals in. What she showed was you want to fence them in because if they're fenced in in fields that had never been used by diseased cattle, then you had a chance of succeeding. She topped it off by going, uh, arranging for Brahmin bulls to be sent in from Texas. Uh, what do you, would you call it, intermarried? 
the, the cattle had relations with each other. And the, <laughs> well, that's the polite term for it. <laughs> uh, and she was producing a much superior breed of cattle. And it made a lot of money. And it um, won prizes. She took them to the Florida State Fair and was winning, uh, winning blue ribbons for that and was elected as vice president of the Beef Association of Florida. Um, I did find in her papers that apparently she never attended a meeting, much to the dismay of the, uh, the chairman. Uh, but on the other hand, he had her name on the letterhead, and that may have been the point of the, uh, the, point of the whole thing. So, Meadow Sweet Pastures, a great triumph. Bertha dies in 1918. She, uh, she dies um, during World War I, breast cancer, um, and uh, she is taken, uh, she lies in state in Sarasota for a while. She's put back on the Pullman car, taken back to Chicago. There is a huge ceremony funeral ceremony, uh, she, the hearse goes through the streets of Chicago, which were lined with people, to Graceland Cemetery, and I'll say my usual bit on this, as you can tell, that, that is where the Palmers are buried, um, and goes to show that you can't take it with you, but the rich can take it a lot further than most of us can. <laughs> Uh, so you see the two sarcophagi there, one for Bertha, one for Pot Potter. Uh, everybody else is buried underneath, underneath the first floor there. Um, so she's dead, but she left her family behind her. And the fact is, is that the, the tremendous influence that Bertha had was, was carried on uh, by her two sons, and by her brother, Adrian. Uh, and I, they're not the subject tonight. I'll merely say that they, uh, they, they created Palmer Farms, which was a, another, it was almost a carbon copy of Bee Ridge Farms. Um, it was about 8,000 acres. Uh, used all the same devices that they'd used before, and they sold it out, made a lot of money, added to the population, the amount of money brought in by Palmer Farms in the 30s, um, well, it was the biggest employer in Sarasota and uh, helped uh, to cushion Sarasota from the full effects of the Depression. Uh, so they play an important role. Uh, I'll just say a word on uh, Temple Terrace. She will Temple Terrace uh, or uh, the, the ranch to her brother Adrian. Adrian then sold it to the people that would develop Temple Terrace. And he served on the board there until his death in 1926. After that, there's no, no particular connection uh, between the Palmer family and, uh, and Temple Terrace. So in sum, Bertha and her family made an enormous contribution uh, not only to Sarasota, but to Southwest Florida's development through their, mainly through their agricultural business operations. Uh, they introduced modern business organizations, scientific knowledge, and the use of new technology. They brought in modern mar marketing techniques and broadened their appeal to sell farm lands to non-farmers who were seeking to get out of the, those northern cities and earn enough, perhaps, to retire. Uh, they expanded the permanent population of Sarasota provided a, and provided local jobs, and they, and they brought in lots and lots of revenue during the Depression. They were also prime movers in creating Sarasota County, which occurred in 1921, uh, and which I write about elsewhere, which is the story of uh, how uh, a, a tremendous commercial rivalry built up between the businessmen and Bradenton, Bradentown as it was called then, and in Sarasota. In the end, it was uh, the best deal for Sarasota was to simply get out of the, uh, the, the arrangement, which they succeeded in doing. 
So again, when you think about Bertha Palmer, uh, think of the two sides of her. There is the glamorous and there is the business person. Uh, and they're both true and they're both important. Uh, the fact that she was a woman, it makes what she achieved down here all the more impressive, by the way. Certainly money cushions a lot of things. But um, she was dealing with Southern men um, and um, who were not all that happy. <laughs> uh, I mean, many of them worked for her and kept their mouths shut. Uh, there were a lot of people in her area that didn't like the wages she paid. She paid the highest wages in the area, particularly to her black employees. Uh, and that really upset uh, other local farmers. And on several occasions, uh, vigilantes raided her estate and drove off her black employees um, to the point where she had to threaten pretty ser serious action but in the end, she proved to be tougher than all of these people, much tougher. And as she liked to say, she never had to say a harsh word to anybody, which I don't know how many of us can say as we move through, as we move through life. So for all those years, or brief years, eight years, she used her national and international fame to keep Sarasota and indeed Florida in the national headlines. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, who has the clicker, by the way? Anybody has the advancing the slides? Oh, it's back there. So, um, that was a fantastic overview of. Bertha Palmer in Sarasota. And so what we want to do, and this thing works, um, is talk a little closer to home. Here we go. Hopefully it doesn't advance it twice. Uh, as Frank mentioned, to Virginia Park. And so Virginia Park was the development here in Tampa that uh, Bertha Palmer actually created. And so, again, as he'd mentioned, she owned the property that became Temple Terrace. She also owned a little bit of property just to the East Virginia Park that became Palmasia. But, um, and as you can see, highlighted there, right in the middle of the uh, Interbay Peninsula in South Tampa, is Virginia Park. And then there's some uh, drawings, or excuse me, there's some photographs of the development around it. So you initially had the idea for it in 1912, but uh, it wasn't until 1915 that uh, she really began to, to push the marketing of it and to finish the construction of several homes. Uh, there's only a couple homes that have been photographed originally, unfortunately. Um, but uh, on the lower right there is 3815 San Pedro. That house is still there, luckily. Um, and there were five other homes that were constructed at the same time in 1915. Uh, fi so five of those six are still standing. And I live in one of them. Um, we didn't realize it when we bought our house that our house was a uh, Bertha Palmer house. But um, it's, uh, it's an airplane style bungalow, which means it has one a second story floor above which is proving to be difficult with uh, renovating our kitchen, which is directly below. Um, and in doing some of the renovations ourselves, when we first moved in, uh, we you know, take away some, some molding and things like that. And I actually found, and actually also found written on my son's room in the second floor, the, the, uh, the words house number four, and it says Boulevard. And the reason why it says Boulevard is because of Bay to Bay Boulevard. That was the main road through Virginia Park. And it was connected, again, as, as, as Frank mentioned, um, she, she had kind of a transportation system mixed in here. The streetcar didn't make it all the way over here and never was going to make it over here. But she actually had a bus service that would take people from downtown and from the, the, a, a streetcar stop near, near uh, the Bay Shore into Virginia Park. And so she wanted to make sure that it was convenient because, again, as that previous slide showed, it was actually pretty inconvenient to get there. Um, it was right in the middle of the peninsula. And even though a, it's, it's adjacent to the Pomacia neighborhood, Pomacia was new at that time. The golf course itself, that the, you know, has the kind of namesake of the neighborhood, wasn't even open yet. It opened in 1916. And so 
there were very few homes between the Bayshore and Virginia Park. So it really was wide open country. You can say, how, how wide open, you ask? Well, that wide open. So this is a panorama uh, photograph taken, I think, at the uh, intersection of San Juan and Del Mabry, what was then called Vera Avenue. There's a couple street names that have changed. A church was called Tampa Bay, excuse me, Tampa Boulevard, and, um, and um, uh, Del Mabry was called Vera Avenue. So this is looking south at the intersection of Del Mabry, which is the straight street looking south, and, Vera, or, and, and San Jose over to the right. And if you see that road, it goes right into the woods. And that's because there was nothing really south of, of Forest, excuse me, of Virginia Park yet. There's also a home over to the right. That home, I believe, is gone, although it could be the home on San Pedro. Um, at least part of, there might be two homes there. The home on San Pedro, I think, is that one as well. So um, again, there's, there is a lot of development within that area. But again, as Frank mentioned, it wasn't super successful. Uh, she died three years after the, the construction of these initial homes. And there was a lot of other activity that happened shortly after that. Of course, the World War I interrupted a lot of the stuff. And then the land boom occurred. And other neighborhoods began taking favor over places like uh, Virginia Park that were so far in the interior. And so it took quite a while for, uh, for it to really take off and develop. There, there are probably of the, so it was 200 acres and you know several hundred homes. But they're really, prior to the World War II or the, the post-World War II era of, of kind of that, that next land boom, there probably were only about 60 or 70 homes that were actually built in Virginia Park, bungalow-style homes, and some uh, Mediterranean Revival homes built during the 1920s. Um, it really didn't take off until after World War II. Uh, and, and now, the uh, Virginia Park neighborhood is divided by Del Mabry, as you see kind of here as Vera Avenue. And our part, we live on, on um, Santiago near Sterling, is actually considered Pomacia now because we're on the east side of Del Mabry. And so they don't, the, the city doesn't follow the, the, the plats the way that, that we do. So we know we're in Virginia Park, even though the city says we're in Palmasia. So uh, that's your little South Tampa lesson for today. And so uh, with that, I'm going to bring up Phyllis Alexandrov to talk a little bit more about Bertha Palmer. Oh, and if anybody has any questions, we'll take Q&A after all this. I'm going to talk a little bit about the artifacts I've located in case you want to take a day off somewhere to go see some Bertha Parma artifacts. Um, let me see here. Okay, um, my interest in Bertha Palmer began when I was a student at the Art Institute of Chicago a long, long time ago. And um, I put these three images together because I thought it spoke to her beauty and wealth and her youth and then her interest growing up in Kentucky and what Mr. Castle spoke about, um, also that she was an avid hunter at one point. Um, but I kept seeing this painting on the left-hand side of Bertha and every time I walked through the museum and students would have to go through the museum on a regular basis. And I kept seeing the painting as about four and a half by eight and a half foot high. And um, it said Bertha Palmer and then the hallway sign and the museum said Palmer. So I went home and I asked my dad, if Bertha Palmer had anything to do with the Palmer House Hotel. And he loved history, so it was, a, it was a lengthy discussion. But anyways, yes, that was her husband. But I didn't understand why she was so young. I thought she was his daughter. And um, this painting was actually painted for the Columbian Exposition for her hall. Um, and we were discussing it earlier. And um, I know that it was at the Ringling Museum in 1963. And Mr. Castle said it had been there for many years, and neither one of us knew how it ended up at the Art Institute of Chicago. But that's where it is. Um, during the time period, uh, as Mr. Castle had said, they had really amassed a great deal of work, artwork, traveling back and forth overseas. And as a matter of fact, um, this is the same image that you saw. Uh, just to give you an idea of how much she collected, she had 90 Monet paintings alone. 90. And uh, Bart Rickbach, who helped me with some of the archives at the Art Institute of Chicago, showed me pictures of the interior of the home that when she passed away, there were so many impressionist paintings with the original ornate frames on them that every bed in the house had them stacked underneath the beds with quilts separating the paintings and hallways with paintings leaning against the wall. So it gives you quite an idea of what her collection was. And, um, and then sometime later, I was talking to a, a, 
a principal from one of the Hillsborough County Public Schools, and he said, you know, I, I know something about that name because when my wife and I bought our lot in Temple Terrace, the gentleman that sold us the lot had this book, and I think her name is on it. Would you like to see it? And I said, sure. So he hands it to me. It was folded up in a bag, and I take it home. 104 pages, I call him back. I said, you know the Redmond family in Plant City, right? He said, yes. I said, well, this is a wet signature document by a Red James Redmond from Tallahassee who was in real estate. This is one of her last will and testaments. And in there, it talked about her entire collection that was being bequeathed to the Art Institute of Chicago um, with $100,000 for the care of the collection and that a wing be named after the Palmer family. So um, you can get an idea what the collection looks like. As a matter of fact, it's the largest collection of Impressionist paintings in North America, and it's her collection, their collection. Okay, um, if you feel like meandering about up to St. Augustine, you know we all love St. Augustine. I was visiting several years ago at the Leitner Museum, and I know you know about the Flagler Museum um, in St. Augustine across the street is the Leitner Museum, which used to be the Alcazar Hotel, and it built itself as being um, the only hotel in the world that had the largest indoor swimming pool. So you can go now, there's no water in the swimming pool, but what's really neat is you can have lunch or dinner in the deep end of the swimming pool, and uh, not too many tourists know about it, so I'm telling you about that. But as I'm walking around a few years ago, um, they had the Downton Abbey exhibition, and um, I'm looking around and I note this red chair over on the right-hand side, Baroque-looking chair, and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And I go over and I peek at the tag and it said, from the castle of Bertha Palmer. I thought, okay, what? And then I turn around and on the wall is a display and it said, castles of America. I'm thinking, well, I didn't know we had castles in America. And they only had reference to two. One was the Hearst Castle and the other one was the Palmer Castle. And I thought, this is, I think I'm in a dream here. And then I turn around and this is a painting um, Oh gosh, the name of it is um, The Temptation of St. Hilarion. And it's very dark because, you know, in so many museums they can't afford to clean their artifacts. It's a much brighter painting. But anyways, this was one of her paintings and I'm looking at the name and I thought, I just don't understand all of this. And as it turns out, a gentleman by the name of Otto Leitner purchased the um, hotel in 1947 and turned it into the museum. And where was he from? Chicago. He was a publisher from Chicago, so he had amassed a bunch of the artifacts when the Palmers sold their castle. And so also on display at the Leitner is this incredible 1880 hand-painted Italian wedding chest. And it's about two foot by five foot. It's just gorgeous. And you can tell by the ropes they don't want you anywhere near it, but it's just beautiful. And then on the right, those aren't real Downton Abbey people. Um, but that's an example of one of the two pillars that are hand-carved marble pillars that why you would collect that from the castle, I don't know, but Mr. Leitner did, and he thought that was important to his collection. And then we all know and love Temple Terrace, and if you drive River Hills Drive, you'll know that that's the original street Mrs. Palmer named. And um, several years ago, Temple Terrace was placed on a national registry. So I was really excited to say, wow, you know, they're finally seeing that Bertha Palmer was this important person. And um, they also, on the right-hand side, is the clubhouse, and maybe some of you have been there. That is the only remaining original building that Bertha Palmer had built. If you drive through, you know, they've renovated a lot of Temple Terrace. If you drive through there on the corner of 56 and Bush Boulevard, they've made murals on each corner of the golf course on one. But Bertha Palmer is on one of them, as is Mrs. Fowler. And everybody thought of Temple Terrace and Mrs. Fowler without realizing Bertha Palmer began that community. Um, but when it rains, Mrs. Palmer gets kind of washed, washed away a little bit. Um, and as uh, Mr. Uh, Castle had mentioned the Oaks, you can go visit the Oaks at Spanish Point. It's mind boggling if you go because she became very interested in cement. And uh, when she traveled abroad, she would see the aqueducts. So if you tour the property in the back, they have, she had cement aqueducts, many aqueducts built, and they turn on the faucet and the aqueducts go back to the gardens to water the gardens. Um, and so we were visiting the um, Sarasota County Historical Museum. The Chisley Building, um, Nancy and I visited a few years ago, 
And there we found some of the original furniture from the oaks. Um, really interesting bird cage. And over here you see some of the um, dinnerware and what have you. Beautiful artifacts. We also found um, this incredible low relief marble bust of Bertha Palmer. But, and it's about four by five foot, and I volunteered to put it in the back of my SUV and bring it over here for display, but they weren't too keen on that. But as it <laughs> turns out, there is no information on the background of it, so we're a little disappointed. And uh, that's what we were discussing earlier about what's going to happen to all these artifacts, because we all know Ringling, and there's a strong awareness of Bertha as well, but there are these really nice artifacts, and what's going to happen to them? Um, they also have... Uh, Potter's Louis Vuitton travel chest with uh, train tickets and postcards and all kinds of interesting things. And then you saw this one and the last one. Um, I visited uh, Mayaka River State Park uh, several years ago and I was talking to one of the volunteers. You know, people come from other states and they volunteer so they can camp for free at state parks. And the lady I was speaking to, I asked her, did she know anything about Bertha Palmer? And she said, funny you should ask that question because that's my job. I have to research um, her property and then put up signage in the park, which I was so thrilled to hear. So you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a, a little plaque that says Metal Sweet Pastures. You can't go in there, but the state bought 17,000 acres of Bertha's property and um, had the CCC people go in and develop that into a state park. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a couple of her existing dipping vats for the cattle, which was just such an amazing, she was so progressive. Um, the vats are about three feet wide, 30 feet long, and seven feet deep. These are cement vats. So the cattle had to swim through them. But unfortunately, you can't go and see them because these particular vats had arsenic in them. But it worked. <laughs> I guess the cows survived, but anyways. Um, and then, of course, the mausoleum. And I was so amazed because, like what Mr. Castle said, she, was a, she wore so many hats. And she was just so amazing to think that, I mean, I can't just imagine managing men on a cattle ranch back in that day, you know, and how, what, how hard she had to gain their respect. Um, and then uh, to finish up, um, there are a couple of DVDs available that I've found. Um, you can go online, and they're kind of interesting. If you go to Chicago and ever visit the Palmer House, I highly recommend it. It's just, uh, it's full of Tiffany that people don't know about unless you take the tour. And Ken Price is their full-time historian, and he often comes to tears. He's so passionate about her. But it's a two-hour tour that includes a, a lovely brunch and a glass of wine as you walk around through the hotel. And it's really quite a great um, um, activity to partake in. So you, know, you can't talk about Bertha Palmer without talking about Chicago and Florida. And it's just amazing that she basically doubled her husband's inheritance within 10 years after she came here. So if you have any other questions, there are more things around Florida, but I just want to highlight a few for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you both to Frank and to Phyllis, and thank you all so much. We have any questions either uh, in person or in Zoom, on Zoom? We have microphones. Oh, we have a, okay, wait for a microphone to come to you. You can ask your question. How many years did, how many years did she stay in Sarasota? How many years was uh, Bertha Palmer in Sarasota? She first arrived in February of 1910 and died in May of 1918. So, so eight years she lived here full time. No. Okay. No, she 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 never lived here full time. So she went back up north in the summertime. Um, well, to Paris. Uh, I mean, she <laughs> uh, she she had other lives, but as she aged. She spent more and more time uh, in Florida, um, and I think it was because she, you know, this was this was a woman that was constantly looking for new challenges, challenges, and that this this was where she had really invested herself, and, uh, and personally, not just in money, personally, and uh, so 
she dies here. I mean, you know, she didn't need to be here. She could have been anywhere. Another question? Mm -hmm. same period of uh, eight years, um, did she do a lot of entertaining in Sarasota? Did she have friends and guests and family come down, or was it more checking in to make sure the businesses were going well? Did she, how much was she relaxing, and how much was she making money? Well, she liked to fish. Uh, she uh, liked to play golf. Uh, so, I mean, she, she, she certainly was not surrounded with the kind of society that she would have had in Chicago. <clears throat> but um, she, she did have her family around her, which was very important to her, uh, particularly the grandchildren. Um, so there's a lot of family stuff that, uh, that, that goes on. I mean, her aunt and uncle moved down here, uh, and uh, uh, her sons, uh, you know, so it was, it was quite, a, quite a crowd. Her, her sister, Ida, uh, married to uh, Ulysses S. Grant's son. Uh, he he uh, spends a lot of time there. And uh, her niece, um, Ida's uh, daughter, uh, marries a um, Russian prince, uh, Prince Katakuzin, um, who actually had most of his holdings in the Ukraine, <laughs> which we're reading about. Uh, but um, he was on the Russian general staff and part of the Russian court. So when he married uh, the, this lady, uh, she became part of the Russian court as well. But uh, when the Bolshevik re revolution came, they were both forced to flee along with their children uh, in quite dramatic fashion to make it back to Sarasota where he becomes a kind of a Palmer executive. And he's vice president of the bank they set up in Sarasota, the Five Points Bank. Uh, and um, she becomes, interestingly, kind of a rabid white Russian advocate um, and really gets involved in a lot of anti-Roosevelt, anti-communist, a kind of activity, I mean, coming from her experience there. But this is a woman that was born in the White House, by the way. <laughs> so. We have a question in the back. Yeah, but this is from our online audience. Um, she was such a forward thinker. Did she have people around her, her, people around her who significantly influenced her, or was it her family? Well, I think it was it was the the three the three people that are most influential in her business life are really her two sons and her brother, Adrian. Uh, and if you look at the corporate ro rosters for all the, the different corporations Mrs. Palmer set up, those three always appear. Uh, so, and, and when there was dirty work to be done, I mean, when there was politics to be handled, um, people to be warmed, warned off, uh, <laughs> It was her brother that that uh, was usually assigned that kind of uh, that kind of work, and he was good at it. Do we have any more questions? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. About the same time, the Collier family came down about uh, 1910 and so on, bought a lot of land. Any comparison in size of land purchase and how they developed uh, Collier County? Well, they're, they're a little bit different in time, uh, but the, of course, Baron Collier becomes a critical factor in the building of the Tamiami Trail, uh, and uh, which was critical to Tampa, but it was also critical to, uh, to Sarasota, and indeed to all the communities along the West Coast. It became the main artery of, of commerce. Um, I'm not sure how close anybody was to him. I mean, he kicked in a lot of money, so they'd name a county for him uh, in the great tradition of rich guys. <laughs> yeah, he came out of the uh, Memphis, Chicago, New York area uh, out of advertising and made a huge investment in Collier County and 
put up the money for the road, which is what I understand why they named the county after him. But I was just curious. Well, that uh, was that was the deal. He uh, the 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 Tamiami Trail was all built for all practical purposes, except for the critical section, which was across the Everglades, and their efforts there had had failed. Uh, for lack of money and lack of application of technology, uh, he he offered to take the state off the hook on the whole thing. You want a county? Sure. <laughs> Just give me the check. Thank you. <laughs> we have another question from our online audience. Um, did her Florida land investments actually make money during her lifetime? Yes. Yes, they did, although not all of them. Uh, as, as you heard uh, from Rodney, that there were problems uh, with Virginia Park. And uh, I'm not sure she made much money off of, of the, uh, the Temple Terrace area uh, either. Uh, there were several that just did not do well. In other words, not everything she did was fantastically successful. But the ones that were successful were tremendously profitable and tremendously changed, caused tremendous changes socially, politically, demographically uh, in, this whole, in this whole area. Uh, so um, as Phyllis said, uh, if, you, if you look at her will, uh, the people that uh, had to come in and evaluate the value of all of her possessions, that she had indeed doubled the amount of money her husband had left her uh, which uh, is an interesting thing. He, he, uh, he took a lot more years to build that up. Of course, I must say, he made a lot of money, but it was, it was, he didn't have any family or anything, and so Bertha was the only one that spent his money. Uh, so she did spend a lot of money there. Uh, but, uh, but she really did show you know, she, she had that pop of personality that allowed her to be successful in so many different areas. And this business thing, you know, for a woman to do that uh, is just absolutely astonishing. I mean, I mean and, only, and she does it only because it's a challenge. And it's, it's something that absorbed her, challenged her, uh, required her to use all of her talents, skills, and, and experiences in order to succeed. All right, well, that's a great way to leave it. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.